Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we worship you. We honor you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your grace. And now again our hearts and our minds are open to be taught the word of God, to be instructed, to be blessed in your presence. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Are you glad to be here? <laughs> Praise the Lord. We have a we have a, a two day meeting beginning tonight so we'll have another meeting uh, tomorrow evening and I want us to share a few things from God's word that I believe will inspire you and bless you this is 2005 right And it's a great year. Yes. Glory to Jesus. Amen. First Timothy chapter number four. I'm reading to you from verse six. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. That's nice if you, you want to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. It tells you one of the ways to be a good minister. It says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith, in of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast also attained. Words of faith and of good doctrine. Some people have good doctrine, but no faith. No words of faith. The message of faith. So you have to have the message of faith and good doctrine. Hallelujah. And then it says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself, Rather, unto godliness. Exercise yourself, rather, unto godliness. A very important spiritual instruction. He says, exercise yourself, rather, unto godliness. Now, what does he mean by exercise yourself, rather, unto godliness? He means, exercise yourself in the God life. Are you getting it? Exercise yourself in the God life. In other words, practice the God life. What do you mean the God life? I'm talking about the divine life. The spirit life. You get it? Now I said the spirit life to be clear enough. Because if, if you say the spiritual life... You just, you might be thinking about the religious life. But I mean the spirit life, meaning the hidden man of the spirit, the inward man, your spirit. God wants us to exercise the human spirit, the inner life. The lot of Christians who are not acquainted with the inner life. They do all the nice things, 
But the spirit is not exercised to God-likeness. And that's what he's saying we should do. Now let's read that verse 7 one more time. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather on the godliness for bodily exercise. You see that? The exercise of the outward man, he says, profited little. The exercise of the outward man profited little. But godliness, godlikeness, acting like him, is profitable unto all things. Hallelujah. Having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. I like this. It tells us how to have a wonderful life on earth, and also a great life in the world to come. There are people who have uh, uh, what by human standard may be a great life on earth, but they sure don't have any light in heaven. They're not going to go that way. They're not going to have any part in the world to come. But it tells us here how we can have a great life in the world that now is and in that which is to come. For bodily exercise profited little. You know, a lot of you give good time to building a V-chest. Some of you try your best to be in shape. Your physical body. You want to be okay. And that's nice. The Bible says, yeah, there's little profit in it. But godliness. Godliness. Godlikeness. Is profitable unto all things. In other words, even what you're trying to get from your physical exercise, he says, if you put your spirit first, you'll be all right physically. Why? Because if you put your spirit first, you would not overeat until you get so fat or become indisciplined not to eat and get so thin. See? So, those who want to be, um, you want to be in good shape, still have a great opportunity by putting God's word first. You don't lose anything. You can't read your Bible until you get too fat. Hallelujah. It walks all around. Now, he says, refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Exercise yourself in the spirit. You know, if a child were left to himself in a room, nobody ever talked to him. Um, he never had to relate with anybody in any way. Never saw anybody walking. They just fed him in a certain way. Made sure he never related with anybody. Never saw anybody walking. Never heard anybody talking. He would grow up lame. Deaf. And dumb. And his mind would be blocked. Because you see. We have to exercise our senses. As we grow up, we have to exercise our senses. And the more you exercise your senses, the more intelligent you become. You exercise your mind also. Now you know, when, you, when you're asked a question, and instead of thinking through the question and, and rendering an answer, you say... But I don't know. The moment you say, I don't know, your mind becomes blocked. You send a message down your system. We don't have to think. Your mind becomes blocked. When you say, well, I can't remember, your brain stops functioning in that direction. It refuses to go. You know, it's like when you, when you try to remember something, your mind plays like a film. 
you know, like the computer, trying to search for the information, checking all the files. You understand? That's the way your mind works. When you're trying to remember something, when you say, oh, I don't remember, it stops the program. You see that? And because of that, uh, you know, thank God for technology. But the more we rely on technology, the less thinking we do for ourselves. You know that, don't you? All those folks who have to use their calculators to find out five, five times two. <laughs> five times two. They get a calculator out. <laughs> they got a problem. Say 320 times 25. They need a calculator. It's nothing wrong. You're just not exercising your mind. That's all. But that wouldn't have been a, a serious problem if it stopped there. It doesn't stop there. A lot of us just don't like to think. We just don't like to use our minds. Some people say, well, I read the Bible, I never, I, I, I never remember the scriptures. Why? Memorize it. When you were taught to memorize the multiplication table, it wasn't because somebody didn't know about the calculator. They're trying to teach you to use your mind. To exercise your mind. Exercise your intellect. Learning to remember things. See? So all of that time you were in school and somebody was giving you notes and notes and notes and notes and notes to reproduce something. It wasn't because they were so interested in the information. They were only teaching you how to find information. How to use your mind. Tell somebody close to you, exercise your mind. Yeah, see, just like you exercise your body. You exercise your body to get better, to be in good shape, you know. You exercise your mind. Now the apostle tells you something. He says, all of that exercise is wonderful, but exercise yourself spiritually. In other words, get your spirit active. Get your spirit active. Train your spirit. Exercise your spirit. He says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Exercise yourself rather unto godliness. Exercise your spirit. Exercise your spirit. Exercise your spirit. Hello. As it exercise your spirit. It's great to exercise your body. It's great to exercise your mind. All right? But exercise your spirit. Because it says, the exercise of the human spirit is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. You want to be successful? Exercise your spirit. Hallelujah. See, I like it when the Word of God shows us our responsibilities. What we can do. Because you see, there are a lot of people who, who expect God to do everything. They just want to, all they want to do is say, Oh God, thank you. Go ahead and work. But God wants you to know your role. There are a lot of people who are angry with God. Why don't you go to church? Oh, I told God to do something for me and he didn't. He failed me. You failed God. See, nature never made a mistake. Come on here. Nature never made a mistake. And nature never produced a failure. There are no natural born failures. No natural born failures. Everybody was born with the seed of success in him. 
And as you were growing up, it was up to you to cultivate the soil of your heart. Decide to grow that thing or to let it fail. Failure is a man's responsibility. God never made a failure. Never. No one was born to fail. If you've been failing in life, failing at work, failing in your family, failing in your finances, it's not God's plan. Now, can you remember that? Say, God never made a failure. Think it in your mind and say, God never made a failure. No one was born to fail. So, success is your right as well as your responsibility. You ought to be successful in everything you do. Now, let no man deceive you by telling you that life is full of ups and downs. He's telling you his, his own uh, uh, experience of life. And that's not good enough. Don't believe it. You don't have to fail and win and fail and win. You don't have to have ups and downs. You can choose to have one, one journey only. Upward and forward. Hallelujah. That's the way I go. Upward and forward. Only. No downs. Hallelujah. No downs. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. Hallelujah. We were born to be successful, born to be God's glory, hallelujah, born to be victorious, to be prosperous, to live a healthy, happy, and fulfilled life. Now, anything short of that is a mystic. Hallelujah. Remember, there are many people who don't believe that. Don't forget it. And because they don't believe that, they can't get it. Now, I've not been sick for many years. And I will never be sick again in my life. But you know what? There was a time that I got sick. And I told you about it. I got sick several times. I got sick, sick, sick. I got sick big. And I won't spend 10 days in the hospital. Many years ago. But you know what? In the midst of the sickness, I said, I believe in divine health. I knew what was better. I knew what the Bible said. I knew I needed to find out something I just didn't know. How to make it work. What was the problem? I wasn't sure what it was. But I knew I, knew I was ignorant of something. One time they were taking me to the doctor. My wife on this side. My younger brother on this side. I still said, I am not sick. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, I am not sick. I said, yes, you're not sick. Yes, yes. And he dragged me there. Sat in front of the doctor. He said, tell me what the problem is. I said, doctor, I am not sick. 
he looked at me and he thought, oh yeah, he now thought I was really sick, you know. <laughs> and they sent me in for some tests. They all came out negative. Everything was negative. But I was, I was in trouble in my body. I said to my wife, I told you I was not sick. She said, yeah, we'll go to another doctor. We went to another doctor. They put me on a stretcher. The man checked me everywhere. My ears, my nostrils, my mouth, my eyes, everything he could check. He checked. Then he was looking. This was 1992. He was looking at me. Then he said to my wife, what work does he do? (laughs) Oh, she said, he's a preacher. The doctor said, I see. He said, he needs rest. He doesn't rest. And then he gave me three, three tablets. He said, if you drive, don't take this. He said, you take them one after the other. I took the first one, it knocked me out. I slept for hours. Took the second one, you know, knocked me out. I got better already. Took the third one, boy, was I good. <laughs> I said, wow, nice. I don't need to rest. All I have to do is this tablet. So what? A few months later, same thing happened again. We went back to that same doctor. And I said, doctor, I know what the problem is. What about that tablet you gave me that time? Can I? I didn't know the name. I said, can I have it? He was an elderly man. He just looked at me. He said, oh, no. You become dependent on it. He said, just go home and sleep. I said, go home and sleep. I need something to help me sleep. He said, that's what you don't need. Just go and sleep. Go and sleep. I said, all right, I'll go and sleep. And I went and I slept and I was better. But then I learned something. Tell you, brothers and sisters, if you will stay in God's word, you will not be sick. But you know, I learned my lesson and um, I stopped running myself down until the battery was out. Did you get it? You know, some of us will not charge our telephone until it was dead, dead. Glory to God. But the point of all that is this. Did I feel terrible in my body? Yes. But it wasn't going to dictate my confession it wasn't going to dictate my believing it wasn't going to affect my faith and that's the reason they couldn't find nothing wrong with me and do you know there are a lot of Christians who are dying without anything wrong with them if you let the devil he could kill you with a strand of hair on your head he could kill you just you coughing if you let the devil. I said, well, we don't know why that fellow died in the accident. Was he supposed to? No. Why did he die in the accident? Well, well he wasn't a Christian. He was very committed. We don't know what happened. What do you mean you don't know what happened? It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility. Oh, my wife was given birth and then she died in the process. What does the word say? She shall, she shall be saved in childbearing. That's written in the word. Why should a Christian lady die giving birth? It's not acceptable. It shouldn't be. But why does it happen? It happens because we don't believe what we say we believe. The word is there. She shall be saved, preserved, delivered, kept. In childbearing. In other words, whenever... You see, it is, it is a natural thing for women to give birth. 
It's not a problem. So why do they die then? They heard the other lady died. They knew her. <laughs> Am I going inside? Oh God, I hope I will come back. <laughs> now to the husband, if anything happens, please tell my father. <laughs> You've been carrying this in nine months now. <laughs> She's crying. She's not even gone in yet. <laughs> That's a labor. It's terrible. <laughs> then she goes in and doesn't come back. And we say, why? What do you mean, why? We make life look mysterious. And it's not mysterious. You know, people, they make their failure look mysterious. We don't know why. It's an attack. What do you mean it's an attack? Are you not supposed to be on the offensive? Now, the message is exercise yourself unto godliness. Exercise your spirit. See, because your spirit is the real you. Your spirit is the real man. Hallelujah. Now, that's where the power of the Holy Ghost is. In your spirit. The only reason the Holy Ghost dwells in your body is because your body houses your spirit. Where the Holy Ghost dwells. There is a spirit life that should be operative. Alright, let, let's look at the word now. Now that's the introduction, alright? You catching it? All right. Now, the first thing for us to recognize in exercising our human spirit. See, I'm sharing with you the how, how to of God's word. All right? Because it's one thing to tell you to exercise the spirit. It's another thing to tell you how to do it. And that's what I want to share with you now. How do you do it? How do you exercise your spirit? Firstly, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Oh, ho, 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 glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I'm reading to you from, <clears throat> from verse 14. And what I really want to show you is in the 15th verse. 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able. Able. They have a divine ability. Able to make thee wise. The Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise. Wisdom is a quality of the human spirit. Wisdom is not in the realm of reason. Wisdom functions in the spirit. Why do you do what you do? Why do you think the way you do? Why do you say what you say? Why do you go where you go? These are all a function of wisdom. Hallelujah. Oh, come on here. He says, the Holy Scriptures which are able, able. See, understand it. He says, the Holy Scriptures which are able. There's no doubt in the mind of God that this will work. He says, which are able to make thee wise. The scriptures are able to make you wise. He says, the scriptures have the ability to make you wise. If you were foolish, if you were stupid, he says, the scriptures are able to make you wise. The smart thing to do then is to go for the scriptures. They'll make you wise. They'll make you wise. See why neglecting the scriptures will be a problem for you? 
See, why neglecting the scriptures would mean that you are programming yourself against success? In other words, programming yourself to fail? The scriptures are able to make you wise. And he says, wise unto salvation. Why does he say that? Meaning, he is not talking about man's wisdom. But the God type of wisdom that produces salvation. What do you mean salvation? He's not talking about salvation from sin. The man had been saved already. So he's not talking about salvation from sin. He's talking about all the beautiful things that God will accomplish in the human spirit. Everything that's consistent with the godly life. The scriptures are able to make you wise. So if you will give time to the scriptures daily, you will be programming your spirit for the life of success, prosperity, and victory. Hallelujah. Oh, I like this. It means that you are putting into you an inner power, power to make you wise. What is power? What is power? Ability to effect change. Is that right? Now he says the scriptures are able. They have an ability to make you wise. To effect a change in the realm of wisdom. So the scriptures have power. Glory to God. All right, now let's look in the book of Psalms and and see a few things that are consistent with wisdom. Psalm 119. Hallelujah. Are you there? Psalm 119, I'm reading verse 11. Thy word. Say that with me. Thy word. One more time. Thy word. What's he talking about? God's word. God's word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. See, we don't know what sin is, but what the word of God shows us it is. See, there are a lot of people who say, this one is a sin, and that one is a sin, and that one is a sin, and that one is a sin. How do you know what is sin? How do you know? How do you define sin? You define sin through the Word. You can't know darkness except the light is turned on. If you've never known light, you cannot describe darkness. So if you will hide the word of God in your heart, you will not sin against God. You know the word of God in you. The matter of sin ceases to be a problem. Because it has the ability to make you wise. In other words, help you make the right decision. Guide you in the way that you should go. And also help you define what is wrong and what is right. You don't have a problem knowing what is wrong or what is right. The word of God has become your light. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. He said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Hallelujah. I like this. Now let's look at something here. In verse... 67, Psalm 119, verse 67. Have you seen it? He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. See, he found the goodness of God when he kept the word. Now, before he kept the word, he was afflicted. He said, I was afflicted. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. 
He went the wrong way before affliction came into his life. He said, before I suffered, I went astray. If your life is full of affliction, you went astray before it came. Listen. Does God just wake up to afflict his children? He just says to himself, I think right now, I need to punish this child. Was he done? Nothing. I love punishing. God's not that way. Even if you are that way. God's not that way. He loves to see his kids happy. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. He says, God is good. Amen. You want to know the goodness of God? Experience the goodness of God. You know some people pray, Oh God, show your goodness in my life. I've suffered so much. Oh God, let people see your goodness. Just keep the word. Just keep the word and it will save you from those type of prayers. Oh God, oh God, let me not be ashamed. Oh God, oh God, don't let me be ashamed. <laughs> you, you will soon become ashamed. <laughs> see, because you don't need that kind of praying. Hallelujah. All right, let me give you a simple example. Look at, look at verse 63. Psalm 119, verse 63. Are you there? Now watch this. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Question, are you? Now, this man was experiencing the goodness of God. And he says, I am... A companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Who are your friends? No, we said David was a successful man. But David shows us how his life became a wonder. What made him a success? He chose his friends. He wouldn't run with just anybody. No, but we say no. We would rather be friends with everybody and expect to be successful. Not, not God's way. Now, hear this. Jesus had friends among those that were not righteous. What did he do with them? Did he become like them? He showed them the way. He preached the word unto them but never went around with them. He was not a companion of those people. He was found in their company at a point, not in companionship, but he influenced them with his message. I have a business partner well, like this, we're tight friends. Is he born again? Not exactly. Look at you. You, you. What kind of life are you living? He's your tight friend. He's your tight business partner. How? See, we have to define our relationships. If he's a business friend, it's business. You know what's beautiful? You know, it's business. It's like a cosmate in school. You understand? You're studying the same thing. Yeah. You may study books together. Do experiments together. Yeah. Good communication. But you should know where you stand. You should define that relationship. No, let, let me put it this way. Let, let's look at it. Imagine you being a guy who has seen to uh, send on a certain official assignment with someone else working on the same project with you in the same office. But this time, it's a lady. Now, because both of you are working on that project, does that make you her husband and she your wife? Talk to me. The relationship is defined. So though she's a woman, she's not your wife. 
Though you're a man, you're not her husband. And you're working on this same project. Which means there are limits to the relationship. Correct? In the same way, when you have a business partner who's not a Christian, there are limits to the relationship. Now, he's made an appointment for Sunday morning. You ought to be in church. He doesn't go to church. And you say, it's okay. How could it be okay? That couldn't be okay. I mean, it's taking you for a ride. He doesn't believe in your commitment as a Christian. Otherwise, he wouldn't make that appointment for 9 a.m. Sunday morning. Now you're saying it's okay. Don't look at me like that. Hallelujah. All right, same Psalm 119. I want us to look at verse number 105. Oh, this is nice. He says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word. Hallelujah. God's word. Is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What the scriptures will do for you. Look at verse 130. Oh, I like this. The entrance of thy words give it what? Light. It giveth understanding unto the symbol. The entrance of his word gives light. See, you want to light up your life? Let the word of God enter into you. As you study, as you meditate on God's word, and it comes into you, light dawns on your spirit. Praise God. The next thing, now, first, I showed you to recognize the power of the Word of God in your life and what it will do for your spirit. Because we're talking about exercising ourselves unto godliness, the God life, the spirit life. Hallelujah. Setting our spirits on for success. Programming our human spirits to lead us. See, until your human spirit is programmed by you, it will not be a sure guide for success. Hello? You've got to program your spirit for your spirit to become a sure guide. Even the time to do it is now. The time to do it is now. Hallelujah. Now let's look at this thing here. On prayer. So that's the next thing. I believe I, I, I should... Um, I should take a step that leads you into prayer. So you can understand the type of prayer we're talking about. It's not all kinds of prayer. It's in John's Gospel chapter number 4. Because people pray everywhere. Alright? So it's easy, it's easy when you say prayer is important. Everybody knows prayer is important, but we're all praying differently. And we don't know uh, whether or not it's working. <laughs> Alright, St. John's Gospel chapter number 4. I'm reading to you the words of Jesus from verse 22. Is it getting in? Is it getting in? Yeah. You catching something? Yeah. Great. Verse 22. Jesus is talking to the woman. The woman at the well of Samaria. Well, she actually met Jesus at the well. And the well didn't belong to the woman. All right. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, God's plan 
was to bring salvation to the world through the Jews. And so Jesus is saying to the woman. Now, verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is. The hour cometh, and now is. When the true worshippers. Mm, mm, say that with me. The true worshippers. See, everybody's worshipping, but Jesus says everyone is not a true worshipper. He said to the woman, you worship what you don't know. He said, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, revelation of God was given to the Jews. And that's a fact. That's a fact. They are the only original people left in the world. The oldest original people in the world. The Jews are. That's another day's talk. But look at this. He says, The hour cometh, and now he is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For, oh, I love this. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. The true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, you know, some people think that um, worshiping, worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth means and then of course the, mass, the, 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 the minister says now they're praying may the Lord hear our prayers they didn't pray no they didn't when Jesus prayed they heard him that's why they wrote for us what he prayed about, what he said in his prayer. When Paul prayed, they heard him. And that's why they wrote for us what he said in his prayer. When the prophets prayed, they heard them. When Abraham prayed, they heard him. When they prayed, they wrote down what they said in the prayer because they were not thinking their prayer. They said. All right, let's pray. So go. That's in the spirit because we're not talking. May the Lord hear our prayers and let our what? Christ come up to thee. They didn't go up to him. They sure didn't. Because nothing was said. If God sees the mind, yeah, look. In Romans chapter 10 verse 9, for those of you who are still praying that way, in the morning you get down, kneel beside your bed and keep quiet. And like that, you don't. After five minutes, relax. After five minutes, you get up. Off to work. You've prayed because you didn't say anything. God saw my heart. Yeah, but he was waiting for you to say something. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, into verse 10, he gives us the principle of salvation. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth. With the heart, man believeth, not with the mind. With the heart, man believeth. With the heart, man believeth. On the salvation, he confesses himself with his tongue. So when you believe with your heart, your heart is made right with God. You believe unto righteousness. But that doesn't save you. Until he says with the mouth. 
proclamation, confession, declaration, announcement is made that catapults you into salvation. Listen, there are many people who are not born again. Do you know why they're not born again? They believe in Jesus. They believe God raised him from the dead. Why are they not experiencing true salvation? Just because of this error. It's a spiritual error. They have not with their mouths made the confession. And that's the key. Now, Jesus said, by your words thou shalt be justified, and by your words thou shalt be condemned. He didn't say by your thinking. By your words. Now, you know, we want God's things, God's ways, without doing God's things, God's ways. It's not going to work. Just think about it. See the mass of people going to hell? Not because they didn't believe in Jesus, but because they just didn't say it with their mouths. What a shame. How simple it is to be saved. So simple. Are you a Christian? No. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Yeah. You believe He died for the world? Yeah. You think He died for you? Of course. Why are you not a Christian? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Then, you know, you, you say, so why? What, what, what are you waiting, what, waiting for? He says, well, um, I, I don't know. Uh, some people say I'm not. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You're going to go to hell. And you think it's a joke. You're actually one step in hell already. Why? He says, he that believeth not is condemned already. Simple principle of salvation. See, we need to show people the Bible way to be saved. See, some of them think that if they, if they went to church, they'll be saved. Some thought if they read the Bible hard enough, they'll be saved. But that's not going to save you. To be saved is so simple. It's the simplest thing in the world. I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. And I confess with my mouth, that he's Lord of my life. I am saved. Now, he may not feel saved after saying that, but it will not change the book. It's a spiritual law. Now, you can say, I don't feel gravity. I don't feel gravity. Whether you know it or not, gravity is there. You don't have to feel it. Well, I don't feel gravity. I don't feel it. All right, jump off of the balcony. You feel it soon. I don't feel gravity. I just don't feel it. Does it matter that you don't feel it? It's still there. If you work against it, you would know. Am I right? Same thing spiritually. You may not feel salvation. Because the Bible doesn't talk about feeling it. He just tells you what to do. I, I don't feel close to God. I don't understand. I just pray and it doesn't seem to go to heaven. doesn't have to go there because He's here with us. doesn't have to go there. No need for the prayer to go there. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Prayer doesn't need to go to heaven, brother. Just say it here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's all. Say it here and it will be all right. The Holy Ghost is with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you still there? He said, the true worshippers, oh glory, the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father's looking for them. He's seeking such. When we start worshipping in church, the Father's not receiving everybody's worship. He's seeking those who would worship in spirit and in truth. 
He says, that's my boy. That's my girl. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Father seeketh such to worship him. He's his God. He's his spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Because God is a spirit. What is he telling you? That your physical body can't worship God because God is a spirit. That if you gave him animal sacrifices, that will not be enough because God is a spirit. That's why he said to the woman, the hour has come that the true worship has. He said, you've heard about worship all your life. You heard about those sacrifices that brought to the temple. He said, but God is a spirit. He didn't eat no animals. He didn't eat no ox or bulls. No. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such.